All right. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Many of you I know and many of you I don't, which is super exciting for me. If, if I haven't met you yet, um, I do look forward at some point in the morning, hopefully, to, to get to say hi to you and get to know you a little bit. Uh, if I've met you before and I forget your name, I'm sorry. Um, that's just unfortunately part of my um, brain's functions. It doesn't remember the important things like your name, and that's terrible. Um, but that, that's a little bit about who I am. My, my wife Annette is here with me, and I, I don't know what I would do without her, honestly, by me most uh, of the time. And uh, uh, we've got six kids, and uh, we were counting up grandkids last night, and with foster kids and everything else, we have like, how many, Annette? Yeah seven right now and one on the way yeah our oldest Anna is getting ready to have uh, a new a baby here in January so yeah yeah we love we love the babies we love the kids and uh, we love uh, being together with you guys today so reading this passage today kind of reminded me Annette and I we we like to watch movies and particularly we like to watch movies that are uh, biopics, you know what biopics are? It's like it's something that happened in the past. It's real, true people, uh, but Hollywood has kind of dressed it up to some degree, obviously, you know. And, but they they introduce us to these characters in some unique ways. And one of our favorite movies is actually uh, it, it reminded me of this story actually reading about John the Baptist. But it's it's the story called The Green Book. I don't know if you guys saw that. It came out a few years ago, won a few uh, Academy Awards and things like that. But the setting is kind of unusual, so it's a, it's a, it's fall and uh, it's kind of late fall, and this guy, uh, they're in a nightclub called the Copacabana in uh, New York City in 1962. So it's it's a pretty cool place, uh, and, and and you you kind of get into this thing, and they've got fun music going on, and lots of food, and lots of activity, and pretty soon a fight breaks out right there at the beginning of the story, and you're kind of going, whoa, this is a weird way for the movie to start, and then this this bouncer comes up and he drags the a party out into the street and make sure that he never comes back to the Copa again to make, you know, make trouble. And so we get to know this guy's name and it's Tony Valalanga and he's got a nickname, Lip. They're just called Lip, not the Lip. You find out later it's Lip. And the reason why he's called Lip is because he likes to dress up the truth a little bit and make it more appealing. He, he, he's kind of, a, I can't say the word that he says, but he, he, he's a BSer, right? He's, he's just this guy, he likes to make things a little more colorful than they actually are. He likes to sell himself and sell parties. You think, wow, okay, so we're introduced to this guy, and it's like, wait a minute, usually when you get introduced to somebody like that, they're the hero of the story, right? They're the person that you're like, well, okay, got to pay attention. So why is this bouncer, you know, in the early 60s, why is he a key character in the story? Well, you find out a little bit later, he's going to meet a guy named Dr. Shirley. And you're kind of thinking, okay, doctor, what, is he a medical doctor? Is he a professor? What is he? You know, and, and, and he's got a, a job opening. He needs a chauffeur. So Tony applies for this job, he gets in there, he gets the job and finds out that Dr. Shirley, first of all, in 1962, okay, so a lot of racial tensions then, is a black man, he's classically trained musician, he is a pianist, he's not an MD, he is a musician, not a medical doctor, and he wants to tour the deep south in 1962 in the Jim Crow South, he wants to play classical music in front of audiences in the south. And uh, you get a crazy wild adventure that happens there. But you get these unlikely characters who come together and they become close, close friends throughout the story. It's an amazing movie. Uh, I, I will say I, I'll be careful to recommend it for you to watch it. I'm always careful about that because it may not. There's some stuff in it that might offend you or whatever. But like the story of it is amazing. And the introduction to these characters reminds me of John the Baptist. Because here's the deal. <clears throat> in that story, there, there's this unqualified guy, right? Tony Valanga, he's a bouncer in a thing, and he's going to become a chauffeur, and he's going to protect this black, he's an Italian, he's going to protect this black man going through the Deep South. He does not seem qualified for this, except for the fact that he's a very tough gentleman. And, and God, uh, I mean, he's kind of put in this unlikely scenario, this unlikely situation, and he's going to do some unexpected things, some impossible things, really. And that's what we see in John the Baptist here. We see that God uses unqualified people in unlikely places, in unexpected ways, right? 
to do impossible things. That's, if you don't remember anything else today, remember this about yourself and about me because I feel this way. An unqualified person in so many ways. I, I was thinking about like, uh, Annette and I were talking uh, last week, uh, my, my mom said she had such confidence in me, like she sent me my senior year, she said, why don't you go to trade school instead of getting ready for college prep? right? <laughs> She's like, go to vocational technical school, right? Because you're not going to make it through college, son. I'm sorry, I love you, but uh, you just don't have the... And I ended up going to college, and I felt like totally unqualified to be in college, right? And to play on a college football team, like when I'm the skinniest offensive lineman you would ever meet, like I weigh 210 pounds, and I'm an offensive guard in a college football team. That just doesn't happen. I felt totally unqualified for the job. Then I finish college and I get a degree in physical education. What's my first job? I'm teaching science, right? I don't really think about science except like, you know, the knee bones connected to the shin bone. I mean, that's kind of it for me. And I feel kind of unqualified. I'm out of my depth. I feel, un, uh, you know, I don't have the bona fides to be there, right? <clears throat> and then getting married. Oh, my goodness. Totally unqualified for that. Feeling like, what am I, how am I going to take care of this woman? I barely, I'm not even out of college yet, right? I'm, I'm still in college when we get married. And then we have kids, and it's like, how in the world can I, I, I was the youngest in my family, I don't know how to take care of babies, and then I ended up teaching my wife how to change a diaper. I'm like, hey, all right, maybe I know something after all. <laughs> We've all been there, right, feeling totally unqualified for the story that we're in, totally unqualified for the situation that we have found ourselves in. We're stepping into something, it feels like a wilderness to us, it's not something we're familiar with, we don't know what to do, and we're not even sure exactly why we're there sometimes. Maybe it's in your work situation. Maybe it's your family situation. Maybe it's just friends in your neighborhood and you're in a situation and you think, how did I get in this wild and crazy situation? And I think for many of us who are Christians, it's like, well, the biggest unqualification we feel is like being able to share our faith with somebody else, right? If someone comes up to you and say, hey, when's the last time you told some of the gospel? I mean, it's just like, uh, right? I mean, we just kind of like, I'm not even sure I know how to do that. I'm not sure I'm qualified to do that. Well, then we see in this story, we see this guy named John the Baptist who seems completely unqualified, right? He's not part of the establishment. He is an outsider in the most classic sense of it. He is not in the dead center of the world. He's out, out in the middle of a wilderness. And he's kind of like one of those toys in, in the uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer story, right? He's on the Isle of Misfit Toys. When I think of John the Baptist, that's what I think of. He's a misfit. He just does not fit in anywhere. He's not cool. He's not slick. He's rough. He seems to enjoy solitude more than he enjoys the crowds. And, and yet somehow God is going to use this guy to do the most important job in the whole universe. He's going to introduce Jesus, his one and only son, to the world through this man. Let, let's read about that. In those first couple of verses, he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight. And then it describes him. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. There is a lot of funny stuff. I, I mean, when I read this, I'm just like, are you kidding me? This is funny. I mean, here's this guy. He is like out in the middle of nowhere, and yet somehow he's supposed to make an impact on the world. He's supposed to make an impact in the middle of nowhere. That doesn't make any sense. Why isn't he like at the king's castle? Why isn't he in the center of the city square? Why isn't he in the middle of the big city making a big stir? God has him in the middle of nowhere. Not only that, he dresses funny. He's wearing a wool coat and a big leather belt. I mean, it's like Santa Claus in reverse. I mean, it's not pretty. It's just ugly stuff. And it's like it's furry, it's scratchy, and like he's wearing this strange clothes. And then he eats weird stuff, grasshoppers and honey. I mean, I like honey on cereal and things like that, but I can't imagine bugs when I'm trying to enjoy a good meal. That does not sound good to me. I mean, it sounds like he belongs maybe on the West Coast somewhere, right? He's got this vegan thing going. He's got this weird clothing style going. I don't know. But here in the Midwest, I have a hard time with this guy, except for the fact that, like, he's out in the woods. I mean, I get that part. Most of us like to be out in the woods. We enjoy that part. But here he is. He just doesn't seem to fit in. And imagine this, ladies. He's single. Right? I mean, you know, can you believe the guy is not married? <laughs> John the Baptist, he, he, he's this guy that he's, he's going to introduce the most important person in the universe to the world. 
And, and you look at him, you go, he's a misfit. He doesn't fit in. In fact, he can't make friends. He's telling these guys, you guys are a bunch of snakes. What are you doing here, right? The religious elite, the guys that he should be making friends with, right, to, to get God's word out, it's like, no, 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 no. He calls them, like, <laughs> serpents and all this crazy stuff, whitewashed tombs. I mean, he doesn't say anything nice thing about them. They say, hey, like, hey, we're, we're Abraham's children. He goes, yeah, well, God can make, like, these rocks into Abraham's children. What is, you, know, you guys are a bunch of... He just doesn't go there. But John the Baptist has a purpose. He, he has a reason for being there, and it's a reason that God has put them there. Now, here's the thing for you and me. We have a purpose. The reason why you are at the lake uh, of the Ozarks, the reason I'm here this week is because we have a purpose. God wants to get his message out to people in this community and so we want people to be able to define, or not to define, but to find their purpose. And that's a good part of why Jubilee exists, right? We want people, first of all, to know God. We want them to have an experience of knowing who God is. We have a message to tell people. And it's not just the message, it's like the truth that they need to hear about God. And we want them to find this sense of family. I hope that today, if you're a guest here at Jubilee, that you're finding it to be a warm place, a place where you can feel pretty much at home here. Like, you could kick your shoes off, and you're going to be fine. It's going to be comfortable here for you. We, we want that for you. That's what we aim for. We want you to be comfortable here to know, hey, this is a safe place to be. But we also, though, we have an edge to that. We want you to discover your purpose. We want you to know why you exist, what it is that God has put you on this planet for, and then hey, get out and make a difference. Go and do the thing that God has called you to do. And the, the way we do that is through growth track. And, and we do this across all our locations. And I know Seth, I uh, mean, talk to him about that. If you're new here, like growth track three is just around the corner. I think this month, uh, I know in our location, we're doing it next week. I don't know when Seth has it planned for you guys, but just talk to him. He'll figure it out. But, but get on that track because it's going to help you discover, like, like John the Baptist, like what it is that you're here to be doing. Discover your purpose and get on with it making a difference in the world. And, and then our church has a purpose, right? We are a community that helps all people know God, find family, discover their purpose, and then make a difference. And so we have this unique uh, contribution to make to God's story. We all live in a biopic, so to speak, right? We're living it out right now. We're the ones who get to be involved in the story. It's not just a movie about us. No, it, it, it's a movie about Jesus. It's a story about Jesus, and we get to be a part of it, an active part in playing it and we get to be like john the baptist for other people that, that's the the unique purpose that each one of us have is that we get to somehow be like john the baptist in other people's lives well, what do i mean by that well several things one is uh, like you may feel like you're in a fairly wilderness situation you don't know like where you are doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you right you also you have a voice you have something to say to people Right? So you have that going for you. And, and you have the most important person in the universe in your life. Jesus Christ is in your life. And so you have, like him, you have this opportunity to share Jesus with other people. So who's, who was, let me ask you a question. I'll kind of turn it just a little bit. Who was John the Baptist for you? Right? Who was the person who helped you when you were in your wilderness? When you were lost without hope? When you were the one who was looking for a, a, some sense of purpose and meaning in life, who was that for you? Well, for me, it was a guy named Steve Ward. Got to see him last week. For those of you who don't know me, I, my, my brother passed away about 10 days ago and, and uh, got to see people I hadn't seen in decades. And Steve w Ward was one of those guys. Gentle soul, pastor, uh, associate pastor guy. But like, so he was there for me in a place where like I'm eight years old and I'm in this uh, huge gymnasium and they're doing like a revival meeting. This guy named Jack Van Impey. He was a fiery end times prophecy kind of a preaching guy. Scared me literally to death. I mean, I was just like scared. And at the end he says, Hey, if anybody wants to receive Jesus today, raise your hand. So I'm sitting on the front row because my mom was in the choir. She had to keep an eye on me, you know, so I have to sit on the front row so she can see me. And she goes, and so I raised my hand because I'm like scared. I'm like, I don't want to like this world to end and, and me to not be, you know, with my family and with Jesus. And, you know, I mean, he's eight years old. And so Steve, gentle guy, comes alongside me, takes me up, and we go into a, a, a locker room in that gymnasium. And in that locker room, he, he leads me to Jesus. He tells me about the love of God, and he prays with me, and he has me pray to receive Christ as my, my Lord and Savior. And, and, and it was just like this gentle touch that I needed. God knew I needed that in that moment. 
I don't know what you needed, but there was somebody that God brought along in your life who was able to get into your wilderness and be a voice to you to tell you, hey, here's who Jesus is. Here's what he's done for you, and here's how you can have life in him. So I hope you've thought about that. Who's the person who was that for you? Now, we're going to go into that a little bit further and think about who we can be for other people, but let's, let's not go there yet. Here, here's what I know about Steve Ward. Here's what I know about Jack Van Impey and different people. It's like, they're like John the Baptist in the way. That they don't care so much about what you think about them. They care more that you hear the message about Christ. It, it's easy for us to get self-conscious, right? It's easy for us to think about, hey, what are they thinking about me? But the reality is, like, they're thinking the very same thing, right? They're wondering, what do you think about me? And so we need to have this confidence, like, hey, it doesn't matter what you think about me. Here's, here's what you need to know about the most important person in the universe. Well, so if you're here today and you're a guest, that's what I want you to know about. Like, we want you to be comfortable here, like, but we really don't care, like, what you think about us. We want to be uh, really unapologetic about who Jesus is. That's the one thing we want to be unapologetic about. And we want to, like, make you feel comfortable and warm here, definitely. But, like, the main thing is, hey, who's Jesus? We've been singing about him all morning. I'm going to be talking about him all morning. I want you to know who he is. So uh, here, here's the way John the Baptist begins to introduce Jesus, right? He says, hey, this, this guy, he's coming after me. He's coming along after me here. I, I want to introduce you to him. In verse 11, he does it in this way. He goes, John says, I'm, gonna, I'm baptizing you with water for repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal I'm uh, unworthy to carry. Like, I can't even carry this guy's shoes, right? That's how big this guy is. And, and he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And, and he goes on, he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And I mean, these are some idioms that, like, you look at them and listen to them, and you go, wait a minute. Who are we talking about here? The great and mighty farmer? I mean, come on. Like, how, how, you guys know great and mighty farmers? Right? You have, no. When you think about farmers, you don't think about great and mighty people. You think about humble people who are in the dirt. Hummus, right? Humility. Those words go together for a reason because that's what it means. To be humble means you're of the dirt. It means you're a person who is, is down there in the dirt with people. Now, I don't usually think about those people as being mighty and significant and big. And John says, no, this person who's coming after me is mighty and giant and big. He's a king, and yet somehow he's humble. He's a farmer. Don't you find comfort in that? I mean, I, I pastor in a small town. We're in Washington, Missouri. There's a lot of grain fields around us. There's soy, there's corn, you know, there's wheat all around us. We're driving down Highway 94 yesterday, coming down here to be with Shannon and Seth and, it's like, and their kids. And it's like, man, there are fields all along Highway 94, just tons and tons of grain fields. And so I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. John says this guy is a mighty baptizer in fire, and he's a, a farmer who likes to gather wheat. Wow, that kind of blows my mind. So let's, let's think about that just a minute. First of all, he's mightier than I. Well, okay, John the Baptist, you're out in the middle of nowhere talking to nobody. Like, it doesn't seem like a big step to be mightier than I, you know? I tell you, you read the Bible, it's funny, right? I mean, you just start thinking about, wait, what is he saying here? So John, he says, hey, this guy's mightier than me. He bab I baptize with water, but he baptizes with something way more significant. Well, what is baptism? You guys... Probably talked about that last week. But it means to immerse, right? It means to be dipped down into. And here's what he's saying. He's like, like I dip you down into water as, a, as an act of repentance. Well, big word, religious word, right? Repentance. What it basically means is a change of mind. It, it's it's the change the thinking that you have about who God is. And, and the thing is, it's like the repentance that you and I need and the people around us in the world, what they need is this. They have a mindset about God, either like he's like this big sky fairy kind of thing who just like grants all your wishes and like he has no gravity, no weight to him at all, or he's this mean, ugly thing that you just can't get along with. And it's like, well, no, 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 he's, he's not either one of those. He, he's good, and he's righteous, and he's just, and he's loving. And so there has to be a change of mind. That's what John's saying is you have to change your mind about who God is. And he's talking to people who are very religious, right? And he's saying, change your mind because you guys are thinking wrongly. And he's also talking about people who are very worldly. 
He says, guys, you need to change your mind. See, the gospel is not for one group of people. It is for the very righteous and self-righteous, and it is for those who are not righteous at all. And, And I think we sometimes miss that about the gospel, but that's what he's saying here. It's like, look, this gospel, you need to repent and quit thinking wrong thoughts about God and about yourself. And he says, in doing that, you, then you need to be immersed in something. And, and, and in that case, John was saying, I'll immerse you in water. Okay, that's a symbol of something. It shows us something of the past. But then he says, but, but this one who's coming after me is going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. And that sounds kind of wild, right? What does that mean? Getting baptized in the Holy Spirit? That's a pretty good thing. Because what that is, is the Holy Spirit, the way we understand it from looking at the Scriptures, is it's God's empowering presence with us, and, and Jesus says, hey, I want you to be completely immersed in this reality that God, his empowering presence is with you. If you are a follower of Jesus, can I hear an amen about that? His empowering presence is upon you, and it is within you because you have been completely immersed by Jesus in his Holy Spirit. Well, what does he do? Well, he empowers us to witness for Christ, He empowers us to endure hardship and suffering, and he comforts us in the midst of hardship and suffering. That's what the Spirit does. In Acts chapter 2, we read about that. It's a little further on in your Bible there, if you're you're unfamiliar, but Acts chapter 2 is kind of the start of the church, and and he tells us there, hey, the, the, the church was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and guess what? There was fire present as well. There's this little emblem of fire that you see over the people of God in that moment. So so the Spirit comes along to empower us, but then the fire comes along to cleanse us. When you read about the fire in the Bible, I mean, I'm glad there's candles here. Like fire, what it tends to do is it gets things really hot, right? I'm not going to put my hand on that. I'm not that dumb. Uh, But but what fire does is it, it, it heats things up. It causes molecules to move a little bit faster. And then pretty soon it begins to, if you let it get hot enough, it will begin to melt things down. So so I have a wedding wedding ring that Annette gave me 36 and a half years ago, right? And it was made out of, it is made out of 14 karat gold. Now, when they took that gold out of the earth, it has all kinds of other metals kind of bound up into it. And so what they had to do is they had to take that chunk of metal, uh, and probably several chunks of metal, to be honest with you, and and they put it in a big pan or a crucible, and they put it over a really hot fire. And that hot fire eventually, like, boiled out all, because it melted the gold, and it melted the lead, and it melted the brass, and it melted whatever was in there, and it melted it all down. And then they were able to scrape off all the gook and leave just the pure gold behind. Fire always talks about purifying. Here's the good news about that. Most of us, when we come into a church building like this, we think, I, before I come to God, I better clean myself up. But see, the, the metal that my ring was made out of, the, the metal couldn't clean itself up. It, it couldn't, because all the gook was like bound up inside of it. And it took the fire to actually pull that out so that, so that someone else could scrape it. Here's the thing. Here's what I'm trying to get at. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Jesus. He's the one who provides the fire to heat your life up a little bit, and then he loves to take and scrape all the junk off so that you're purified in heart. And he talks about burning things up a little bit later. We'll we'll get into that as well. But the fire burns things up that are worthless. See, what we're afraid of sometimes we come to Jesus is like he's going to discover what's worthless about us. Let me just tell you this. He already knows what's worthless about us. And I, I can't always discern what's worthless and what's worthy, right? But he can. He, he can get rid of that which is worthless, and he can keep that which is actually worth saving. And, and that's what we see in Jesus. That's what we see in him. Now, what does it require, though, for that to happen? Well, it requires heat. <laughs> or, in, in one case, he describes the wheat harvest in this way. He says, Jesus has a pitchfork in his hand. I was like, wait a minute. I thought Satan had a pitchfork. In it. No, no, no. Jesus has a pitchfork in his hand. It's not for torturing us. It's for cleansing us. What, what are, how do you use a pitchfork in a wheat harvest? Well, you, you, you dig it into the wheat, and you toss the wheat up into the air, and all the chaff and the stems and all the stuff that you don't and can't eat 
gets kind of blown away. It's, it's worthless. It's lightweight. It just floats away. But what's solid and what's pure and what's wonderful, the wheat itself falls to the floor, and it's able to be salvaged. See, that's what Jesus does. He allows your life to kind of be tossed up in the air sometimes and heated up at times. Why? Well, to purify, to get rid of the stuff that's actually that's no good so that he can salvage, he can save what is right and good about you. See, God created you and me, and we've been damaged, we've been broken, we have stuff in our lives that needs to be getting rid, gotten rid of, and we cannot do it. But here, John tells us, oh, but there's someone who can, and his name is Jesus. He's the great farmer. He's the mighty farmer who comes along and cleanses you and me and saves us. Here's, here's what I know about farmers. If you hang around them at all, my, my wife is not a farmer. She's a gardener, but her family have been farmers and gardeners, and it's the same kind of principle. Guess what farmers and gardeners love? They love dirt, yeah, but they love the harvest. See, the dirt's important, right? And, and, and the plants are important, but why are they important? Because there's a harvest, because what you want to do is you, you actually want to feed your family and you want to feed the world around you. The harvest is vitally important to the farmer. He does everything. He sacrifices everything to be able to get his harvest into the barn. See, that's what Jesus is for you and for me. He loves you and me so much. He wants to save us. He wants to bring us into his family. He wants to bring us into his barn and the reason or the way he goes about doing it is he uses people like you and like me to bring other people the harvest into the barn so to speak to bring family into the household maybe that's a, a word that means a little more to us that's what jesus uses you and me for remember the big point god uses unqualified people in the most unlikely places, doing the most unexpected things to do impossible things to bring people into his kingdom. He uses you and he uses me to do that. So here's the question next. Who can you be John the Baptist for? Who can you be John the Baptist for? Verse 1 says this, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And here's what he said, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is the one who spoke of the, uh, by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his ways straight. It seems that most of the stories in the Bible involve a wilderness, doesn't it? Like you look back in the Old Testament and you see the people of Israel are having to go through a wilderness. You look at the prophets and they're talking about wilderness experiences. You look at Jesus' life a little bit later on. He's going to be in a wilderness. He's going to be in a desolate place that has no pathways in it, and it's just a hard, difficult place to be. And here's what I realize about the people that are in our lives. We have friends, we have family members, we have coworkers that are in desolate, wilderness places in their lives. And what we are called to do is to be those like John who go into those desolate places to be with them and to be a voice who gives them the direction to Jesus. So what are the kind of the places that people can be in that they need you, you to be with them in? Well, sometimes it's actually kind of good things, but they're, they're, they're places of life where there's transformation or there's change that's happening, and yet they somehow don't quite know where they are and what's going on. So, for example, having a new baby is a wonderful experience, right? First baby especially. You get that first baby and you are suddenly in a wilderness. You've had this beautiful experience of having a baby, which maybe that scared you because you were like me and your wife said, hey, you're going to be in labor with me the whole time. You're going to coach me through this. And I'm like, okay, unqualified. Don't know how to do this, right? But we learned and, and God helped us through that. Here's the thing. There are going to be beautiful experiences that people have, but then on the back side of it, it's like, now what do I do? How do I deal with this? People are going to buy a new house. They've never owned a house before. They don't know how to take care of a house, and they're going to be in a wilderness because there's going to be repairs that are going to happen, and you can be there to help them figure that out, right? So good things can happen. New jobs, new family members, all that happens. 
but they kind of stir things up. They heat life up a little bit. You feel like you're in a wilderness. feel like you're in an unfamiliar place. Bad things can happen. As I said, my brother died a few couple of weeks ago, so it's like, hey, that's a terrible thing to have happen. It broke my heart, breaks my heart still to think, oh, my goodness, I'll never in this life get to speak to my brother again. That's a devastating thing to have happen to you. If you've had someone recently who've, who's passed from your life, man, it's a hard place to be. And you've got friends out there who've experienced that as well. And they may not have hope. And you can be a voice of hope for them. It could be that they've had a breakup of a relationship of kind, some kind. And they need a voice who comes into the wilderness with them. And you and I, we get to be voices like that for other people. So here's what I want you to do. Practical thing. Got a pen? Got a phone? Take a note. Take a note real quick. Write down two to three, maybe five people at most that are in your life that you know, like you look at their lives, you go, they are in a wilderness place right now. They're in a wilderness place. Who do you know like that? Write their names down. Just first name or coworker or whatever it is you write down. But just Get those names down. Because I want to help you. I want to help you to be able to enter into their wilderness a little bit. All right? Here at Jubilee Church, we use this amazing uh, acrostic, this, these five letters to help us to, to get into other people's wilderness. The first letter of that is B, and it means this. Begin with prayer. How does the Bible describe John? He's a voice crying out. What do we do in prayer? We're a voice crying out to God for other people. We're going to be doing that here in January. A week of uh, fasting and prayer is going to be coming out. I hope you guys will make uh, your way out here January the 8th through the 13th. What a, an amazing time. We always take time to, to pray for our friends and family who don't know, know Jesus yet. You don't have to wait for that. Like You can pray right now for people that are in a wilderness. But like during that time, as a church, we will cry out, all, however many of us there are, 800 or 1,000 people that are part of Jubilee, we will all be crying out for people who are in a wilderness place. Why? Because that's what, that's what God calls us to be, is those who cry out. So that's the B. We begin with prayer. We listen to them. We find ways to get in conversations where we're listening to them, not just talking at them. Christians have a terrible reputation for this. We love to talk at people about this is the way things are. Here's the reality. We need to be listening to people so that they can tell us how things really are in their lives. Find out where their wilderness places are, where the places are they're hurting and damaged and need help. We need to listen more than we need to talk. So we do that, and then we do it in an amazing way. We do it over a meal, right? I have great, com we had with dinner with uh, the, the Heinz last night and just had an amazing time of talking about everything and nothing, right? We just, we had a great time together. That's what happens around meals. That's what's going to happen with your lost friend who doesn't know Jesus yet. They're going to talk about stuff, the important, the unimportant, it doesn't matter. The point is you get a chance to listen. What are they putting their hope in? Where do they need Jesus to enter in? And I, I, get, I guarantee you'll find out some place in their life where they can be served. There will be something that they will expose to you where they need some help. And you will be the person who maybe you feel unqualified, but you will be the person to be able to meet that need. And then eventually you'll be able to share your testimony. You'll share. B-L-E-S-S. -S. You serve you share your story. Now, here's what God calls you and me to be, just like he called John the Baptist. He didn't say, hey, I want you to be my defense attorney. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be able to prove the existence of God and all those things. All you have to be able to do is share your story. Tell your story. How did God get a hold of you? What has he been doing recently in your life that you can share with that friend of yours? You're to give testimony, not to defend you don't have to worry about that. Let God defend himself. You get to share your story. Can you imagine a church that actually takes that on board? That we fervently pray for those who are in a wilderness and we're willing to go into the wilderness with them and we're willing to listen. Where are the pain points? What are the situations in their lives? Where's the fire in their life that's burning up and they don't know what to do with it? Where's the, the, the chaff that's being pulled away from their life that they don't know how to deal with? Can you imagine a people who compassionately come alongside those people and then share with them the best news in the world that Jesus, the great farmer, loves them and wants to bring them into his household. 
to be a part of his family. The impact it would have on this lake region is astounding. You guys can make such a huge difference here at Lake of the Ozarks, right? You guys see people from all over the world who come in here. But you also see people who've been at this lake for their whole lives, maybe for generations, and they have lost hope. And Jesus says to you, I want you to be like John the Baptist. Go into their wilderness and cry out for them and cry out to them that there is a way. Point them to Jesus. You guys willing to do that? To make a difference in this community by telling them? And this Christmas season is an amazing time to do that. Invite them to come. Come to Christmas Eve. Come to our our services. Come and hear the message of our beautiful and wonderful Savior, Jesus. Let's stand up together. Can I just, I just want to pray for you guys. Pray for us this morning. Because I feel this too. I feel in preaching this and reading this again, I was reminded that Jesus calls us out of apathy he calls us out of apathy, right? And where we can find comfort in, you know, all kinds of things. He says, hey, I want you guys to be awake and alert to the people around you. Don't, don't become complacent. Don't become apathetic. Hear the story of John the Baptist. Yeah, things a little radical, sure but we point people to Jesus. Father, I pray that you'd help us today to be a people who we are passionate about our Savior, that we don't grow apathetic and complacent just because we're in a small town in a small community that man, it doesn't look like there's much hope. No, no, we are the bearers of hope to this community, Jesus. You have called us to be that. I pray for us to enter into the wilderness of people's lives. I pray for us, Lord, to, to be those who uh, we, we introduce, we make a straight path to Jesus. We take down every barrier. We take down everything that keeps people from coming. And Lord, we make it clear, Jesus is our wonderful and great and mighty farmer who loves us and brings us into his household. Would you do that, Lord? In these moments right now, Awaken us out of complacency. Awaken us out of apathy. Help us to love the people that you've put us in community with here. Desperately. Not clinging to any other hope, but clinging to you. In Jesus' name.